probably noticed this. Your history classes revolve a lot around war. And that's because war concentrates a lot of information about a time period, and it's very easy to make questions about them. They have a detonating event with a very specific date and location, there's action and you'll have battles led by identifiable men and they usually end with a peace treaty that you can point to without difficulty. But what about peacetime? You might think there's not a lot of things going on then, no cities fighting one another, yet that's pretty much how we spend or aim to spend our lives. We work, we gain or lose wealth, we seek education, we pursue values that we collectively aspire to. We evolve as a society and suddenly we find ourselves different than 50 years ago. But unlike war, traceable events are harder to come by. I mean, it's not like somebody officially inaugurated the renaissance or declared it was over, not that it happened everywhere at once. But more or less, for the 250 years that span from the late 14th century to the early 17th, the interest of European society started to shift from the very religious to be centered around man and mankind. Now, this is called humanism, and will pretty much define everything that goes on during this era. In that sense, the Renaissance, which stands for rebirth in French, can be considered as the bridge between the medieval ages towards the modern era. It was a cultural movement that started in Italy and then spread to the rest of Europe. But why Italy? If you remember, the Crusades were these military campaigns for which the Pope had called upon all knights of Europe to fight against the infidels that were currently living in Jerusalem and most of the places considered to be holy by Christianity. There had been seven Crusades, and the last one ended in 1289. What they left behind were routes that connected not only Europe to the Near East, but also Europe within itself. And since the threat of the Black Plague had ended, people will now venture outside their hometowns or village. They were very small. Now, this is something that hadn't happened before. During the Middle Ages, people would rarely leave the protection of the feudal lord and expose themselves to the dangerous roads, where you were constantly threatened by bandits and the force of nature. But now the knights were back, and traveling was suddenly a little more accessible. One of these men that ventured outside was Petrarch, considered by many to be the first tourist because he traveled not because he needed to, but just because he liked it. I mean, it's weird, right? Anyway, in one of his travels in an old monastery, he happened to find a bunch of papers that were no other but one of the few remaining copies of Cicero's letters. Now, Cicero had been a classical Roman philosopher, and yet most of his work, like that of the rest of his fellow classical intellectuals, had been lost during the Middle Ages. Probably because since it predated Christianity, the church didn't want to do anything with it. Anyway, Petrarch found these letters and became fascinated by it, wondering how could it have been that hundreds of years ago the spirit of mankind had achieved a degree of elevation that was now lost. Actually, he was the first to coin the term Dark Ages, referring to the way that people had been living these past years in comparison to the sophistication and cultural elevation that had been attained by the Greeks and the Romans. He figured that man had been forgotten for the sake of God, and this needed to be reverted. Thus, he began humanism, a cultural movement that aimed to replace God with man as the center of the universe. Now, this doesn't mean that he was promoting atheism or any of the such. It was more like a shift from the medieval, let's endure this world while we wait for the next, towards uh, let's use our God-given gifts to glorify him in this life. Now, under the banner of humanism, mankind became more interested in the real world. After all, it is no coincidence that during this time of exploration, America was discovered. Another thing that came with the routes established with the Crusades was trade. I mean, if you were a knight and you had been to Damascus and tried the softness of silk and how tasty food becomes with spices, you probably would want to continue to enjoy those products once you came back home. And since now there was peace and your nightly services weren't required anymore, what better way to put your talents into use than to become a merchant? After all, not a lot of people had the previous experience and the cultural savvy to take on those missions. By the way, also from this time, Marco Polo, a Venetian merchant traveler who went all the way to China and spent some time in Kublai Khan's court and came back to tell his story and spread the world about the exotic riches he had seen in that faraway country. Commerce flourished during these years, and the cities that were on the trading routes benefited greatly from it. Trade, however, is the sort of business that needs to be financed. 
you're definitely going to return with merchandise that'll surely make you rich. But how do you get there in the first place? So banks became a major player in this game. And if something that you can be sure about is that banks will always make more money. So there was an incredibly amassing of wealth like there hadn't been before. One of those very successful banks was the one run by the Medici, the most powerful family of the Italian city of Florence. Not only were they the richest, they actually held power and were so important to public life that the palace in which they lived held the most prominent location in the city, right in front of the city square, a place where usually you would expect to find a church. Not in Florence though, and certainly not with the Medici. You see, at the time, Italy didn't exist as a unified country. Instead, you had a lot of smaller republics, like Florence, Lucca, Venice, and Genoa, duchies like Modena, Milan, and Ferrara, kingdoms like Naples and Sicily, and the Papal States, governed by none other than the Pope itself. All running as city-states, all enriched with this trading boom, and all strongly competing against each other. Yet, since war is probably not the best idea for trading-based societies, instead they battle each other to have the most beautiful city. Isn't that great? And so rather than gloating in their own wealth, the Medici used their fortune to become mecenas, that is, patrons for artists that with their work will instill civic pride in their town. One of Florence's latest achievements, and one that all neighboring cities envied, was a dome that crowned the Cathedral of Santa Maria dei Fiori. Designed by Filippo Brunelleschi, it required more than 4 million bricks and still remains as one of the largest buildings in Italy. Great efforts were made to promote culture. For example, Dante Alighieri, who was also from Florence, wrote his divine comedy not in serious Latin, but in his native Tuscan language to make it more accessible to the common man. By the way, it was probably because of the popularity the divine comedy had that Tuscan became the basis for standardized Italian. Another example of a Florentine effort on the battle for the most beautiful city is Michelangelo's David. A year before, this young sculptor had become famous for his impressive Pieta, a massive marble statue depicting the Virgin Mary holding the limp body of Jesus after he was taken from the cross. The Pieta had been commissioned by a cardinal and it remained in Rome, but Michelangelo had been born in the Republic of Florence. The Medici wouldn't have that, so they commissioned the symbol for the city, one that will send Rome the message that they may be headed of the church, but the power of Florence was something to be feared. Michelangelo found the perfect analogy in David, the biblical hero who against all odds defeated the giant Goliath. David also provided him with an excuse to showcase his skill depicting the beauty of the human body. Michelangelo went beyond anatomical accuracy to emphasize the most representative and human parts of the body, as can be seen on the larger head and hands. The David was placed in the square in front of the Medici palace. And it wasn't a coincidence that his piercing and challenging gaze was just in the direction of Rome. After the David, Michelangelo was called back to Rome, this time to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel, where nine panel passages of the Old Testament are depicted. Considering himself a sculptor and rather than a painter, Michelangelo was very reluctant to take the job, but only accepted after the Pope Julius II agreed to give him full artistic license. When Michelangelo was called back to Rome, the Medicis then call another notorious man, who already had a reputation not only as an artist, but also for his talent as a military architect and engineer. Leonardo da Vinci started to paint the Battle of Anjari in one of the halls of the Medici Palace, but like many others, he ended up abandoning this project. Like Michelangelo, to ensure anatomical correctness, Leonardo often sneak into the morgue to dissect and understand human bodies, and his thirst for knowledge went much beyond that. He filled notebooks with notes that go from the geometry of the human body to how babies develop inside the mother's womb, war machines and flying machines, and many other topics, pretty much everything that interested him, however briefly. By the way, if the letters in Leonardo's notebooks look weird, it's because he wrote them from right to left to make them illegible in case a rival might steal them. Leonardo da Vinci was by all means the best example of the Renaissance man, well versed in many fields of study and unafraid to push himself beyond proven techniques, always experimenting new ways. Unfortunately, but predictably, not all his experiments were successful. Right after he finished the Last Supper, a fresco that had been commissioned by an order of monks to be painted in a wall of the convent's refectory, 
the painting started to chip and fall off because he had used an unknown technique. The Last Supper required immediate conservation work and pretty much ever since. Still, it works as a perfect example of linear perspective, another Renaissance innovation. With linear perspective, a painting aims to portray things as they're seen in the real world, where visually all lines extend to a vanishing point. Besides linear perspective, Leonardo also played with atmospheric perspective. This one involves the use of clearer shades on the background, becoming blurrier and blurrier with distance, as if fog blocked the view. The most famous painting in the world exhibits this quality. He started painting the Mona Lisa while he was in Florence, but when summoned to court by the French king uh, Francois I, he took her with him, continuing to work on her until the time of his death in 1519. Following the trading route, the ideals of humanism and renaissance spread to northern Europe. Using oil paints brought from Asia, the Netherlands painter Jan van Eyck achieved uncomparable levels of realism. In Germany, Albrecht Dürer made engravings in woodcuts, making an art form that was easy to reproduce. But no other invention was more important than that of Gutenberg, who in 1414 created Europe's first printing press. With this invention, Ideas spread faster than ever before. In England, Erasmus published in 1509, In Praise of Folly, a satirical attack on superstitious European society as well as the church. In Utopia, Thomas More presents a fictional ideal society in which nobody is lazy and everything is perfect. A couple of decades later, a poet will appear on scene to later become the greatest writer in the English language. Now back in Germany and far away from Rome, the monk Martin Luther disapproved of the church's fixation with money and published in 1517 95 theses in which he condemned Roman practices, thus initiating what will become the Protestant Reformation. So rather than the period of linear development with pinpointable beginnings and endings, the Renaissance was a cultural movement that greatly shifted the interest of European society, evolving from a disconnected center towards a network of diverse, sometimes converging and sometimes conflicting cultures, an idea of the world that we still maintain to this day.